Jake Stewart with the National Sports Media Association. And today I'm joined by two-time Missouri Sports Writer of the Year, Derek Gould. Derek, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Nice to talk with you, Jake. Absolutely. Well, first off, congratulations on your award. This is your second from the National Sports Media Association. What does this mean to you, Derek? Well, it's nice because, you know, a lot of the a lot of your peers vote on something like this, which is really cool to do. And and I know that, you know, it's a nice honor to receive in that regard because you know that it's other folks who are in sports writing, um, sports editors, sports broadcasting that are making their choices. Um, you know, for me, it, it's really nice to to win and but even to just be included because I have so many friends in Missouri who uh, mean a lot to me. You know, you think about like uh, like Avahi Warren at the Kansas City Star, some of my colleagues at the Post Dispatch, like uh, Hall of Fame baseball writer Rick Hummel. You know, th this is a strong group of sports writers here, and so I've learned a lot from them. And uh, you know, conversations like this or uh, or an award like this is a chance to talk about the people who I've learned from, um, which is which is great. Derek, you're the St. Louis Cardinals beat writer. Uh, what, what brought you into the industry uh, way before you, you, you became the beat writer? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I went to the University of Missouri, and uh, part of my thinking there was to, uh, well, obviously go into journalism, um, but was to cover politics or cover, uh, you know, uh, civil liberties and like courts, like federal courts, Supreme Court, stuff like that. Um, that was kind of where my interest was. Um, but I'd always had a deep fondness um, for baseball and you know for me the newspaper and baseball were kind of symbiotic right I, I grew up in what I call the time zone baseball forgot um, the Colorado Rockies did not show up until 1993 so you know a young me to age myself would be clipping box scores um, from the daily papers you know the daily camera the Denver Post and the, the great Rocky Mountain News um, and that's how I would spend my morning um, clipping box scores pouring through them um, and that was my connection to baseball and over time, you know, as I was at Mizzou, um, early on there, they offered me a chance to cover sports. And I said, all right, I'd really like to see if I might cover baseball. Um, so cover college baseball and write about college baseball and be around college baseball. And, you know, it, it dawned on me that like the opportunity to cover sports was interesting because you got to do so many different styles of stories. You could do breaking news. You could do features. You could do investigations. You could do issue stories. You could write analysis. You could, you know, move on in your career and write columns. Um, just basically, it was this great toy box of different styles of stories that you could write. And that just kind of took over. Um, you know, that became my pursuit. Um, eventually, I kind of had the idea that maybe I wanted to try to see if I could become a baseball writer um, and really kind of focus on that. It took, took me a while. I went different places, but I learned a lot covering college football, the NBA, and the NHL um, kind of along the way to, to, to finally getting in a chance to uh, audition as a baseball writer and then never let go once I had the chance. And, and you know, I, I really like the challenge and the responsibility of being a baseball writer. I mean, it hasn't, it's something that I keep in mind every day about like, you know, like I was biking to the single copy box. Um, I guess now it's opening up an app, but back then it was biking to a single copy box to read what the baseball stuff was because it's a daily thing. And, and for me, the newspaper and baseball are like that, right? You know, you, you have to you have to do it again tomorrow. And I really like that aspect of it. Wow, that's an awesome story, especially like you mentioned, you kind of getting your start right as the Colorado Rockies got their start. That's pretty awesome. I, I'm curious, Derek, who are some of the sports writers that you looked up to growing up? Yeah, I mean, like like a Jack Curry um, at the New York Times. I read a lot, you know, obviously Peter Gammons, who uh, you would see on ESPN. But um, I remember reading you know, when I could get a chance to go get the Sunday Glo Globe um, there in Colorado, sometimes it came on Tuesday or Wednesday to really put in perspective. Um, you know, you read Peter Gammon's notes columns. You, you know, I, I really appreciate what Jack Curry did. I know that, you know, Buster only on um, the book he wrote, The Last Night of the Yankee Dynasty, that really gave me a lot of insight into what a beat writer does. You know, of course, you had like the greats at Sports Illustrated, Gary Smith. Um, you know, I also read a lot of like, uh, like new journalism, I guess, as they called it. Um, you know, you have like, uh, I mean, like Tom Wolf and stuff like that, being exposed to that group, um, Ted Gupp, being exposed to them in, in college really helped me understand what was possible, um, whether you're writing 2,500 words or 450 words, um, you know, the different ways that you can tell a story. And one thing with sports is you know something is gonna happen. It's, it's on the schedule, there's gonna be a game 
And because there's going to be a competition and there's going to be one team trying to win, um, you know, and because there are people involved, it's going to be quite a story to tell. It's just a matter of finding that. So, um, you know, and then I mentioned Vahe. Uh, Vahe's Gregorian at the Kansas City Star. I got a chance to work with him when I was in college um, and meet him and then work again with him at the Post-Dispatch before he went off to stardom at the Kansas City Star. And, you know, just, just seeing how a, a gentleman sports writer works and the tender care that he gives both his interviews and his writing, it's such a model for, for me and for so many young writers to, you know, who got to know him, just what was possible with the written word and what was possible when you took the time to listen more than ask, or I'm sorry, cool. listen more than, uh, than, than talk. Well, being around it, as long as you have Derek, uh, I'm sure you've been around some pretty sweet moments, just, you know, covering the Cardinals. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, uh, uh, pool holes to name a few, uh, to just name one, even one player. Uh, his his coming return back or <laughs> like, it's returning. Holes, right, or? right, right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm curious, Derek, what, what, if, if any, what event uh, or a piece of writing stands out to you uh, as one of your favorites to cover? Oh, goodness. Um, I've been lucky enough to, to cover quite a few. Um, you know, I think of Albert Pujols' home run in Houston that sent a series back to a condemned ballpark. Um, they were going to tear down Bush, too. Um, no more games there you know, until Albert Pujols it's that home run off of Brad Lidge. Um, of course, game six of the 2011 World Series, where, uh, where you had David you know, Freeze, hometown boy, do all the things that he did. That game, a lot of people may not remember. It started kind of sloppy, but then ended tremendously dramatic. Um, and then the Cardinals go and win the World Series the next night. Covering that, um, you know, the parades in 06, the parades in 11 stand out, um, particularly the night in Queens, in 2006 at the game seven of the NLCS. That's the night that Adam Wainwright landed a curveball by Carlos Beltran to freeze him and win the pennant. That whole evening was remarkable. I, I sat in the auxiliary press box next to my late colleague, great colleague, Brian Burwell. And, you know, we just were, we were amazed by what we were watching. Um, you talk about a game that is so rich with different like plot twists, right? You got Andy Chavez's catch to rob a home run from Scott Rowland. You got Jeff Supon working his way out of a jam immediately thereafter because Scott Rowland commits an error. You got Yadier Molina, who did not have the season, the regular season that he wanted, was, was frustrated by his batting average. Then he hits the two-run homer. He guides Supon through that mess. And then on his way back to the plate as they're dealing with Carlos Beltran, who is one swing away from sending the Mets to the World Series, you know, he, he improvises a changeup. Um, to set up what was is one of the most famous curveballs in baseball history. Um, certainly one of the most famous curveballs in Mets and Cardinals history. So, you know, th those events are all there to be seen. I think, you know, one of the stories that I was really, there are multiple, I mean, there have been stories I've been challenged by um, a couple that stand out as far as the, the, the response or three that really stand out. One, writing a story about Jason Mott and the friendship he developed with a young boy. Um, who was, you know, fighting cancer and, you know, just the relationship that they had, the friendship, the bond that they had, they, you know, Jason was very open with me about what that friendship meant to him and what it brought to him. And so was the family of the young boy. And I felt like I had to kind of, if they're going to share their story with me, I needed to rise to the occasion um, sure. and tell them right. Um, you know, and then, uh, and then uh, several years ago, I got a chance to go to Havana, Cuba with um, Major League Baseball and what they were trying to do there as far as baseball diplomacy. Um, I knew that a lot of eyes would be on that. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a challenge um, to really capture what was happening there and a great, great story to try to tell, um, a great experience to, to be a part of, to see if baseball could be part of a bridge between two nations. Um, and then most recently, and far less gravity to it, but, but also history in its own right, um, when the Cardinals won 17 games. Um, you know, they won 17 consecutive games, and that 17th game, no, you know, that, that, that we hadn't had a game story like that in the paper before. So I knew that that was one that not only people would read, but maybe that people would return to later. And that was a real challenge that I embraced, and I hope I pulled it off to kind of capture what that moment meant, um, not just that they were studying history with the 17th consecutive win, but that they had brought themselves all the way back from the brink and now we're clinching a playoff spot, which is ultimately how the Cardinals are judged.
Wow. Well, you, you brought up so many different moments and, and, and all unique in their own right. Uh, you know, I'm sure for Cardinals fans listening, every one of those rings a bell. Uh, you know, I want to ask you, Derek, you spoke earlier about the digital age and just how, uh, you know, you can open up an app now and read your favorite story. You don't have to walk. You don't have to grab a physical paper. How much do you think changed uh, with COVID and how much did your work change as a writer? It's a great question. Um, do you have a few hours? Um, <laughs> it, you know, I mean, really, um, covering. So in 2020, um, during that, that year, um, I, I did travel to all the games. I went to all the games that they would let us into. Um, I drove. Um, to every game but the playoff game because the playoff game was in San Diego. Um, you know, and access was at a distance. But, you know, going into an empty Wrigley Field, going into an empty, you know, Bush Stadium, going into an empty Miller Park with no fans but a game to, to cover um, was, a, was a challenge in the sense that it's like, okay, what do people want from this story? They can't when, – when fans can attend a game and watch a game, you try to tell them something that they know that they can't see. So you try to write what's beyond the game, right? Like the context or the stories that behind the scenes or, or the comments that they don't get. You want to tell them something about the game that they watched that they don't know. In this case, it was tell them about the experience that they can't have. The doors are closed to fans. So how do I bring them into the this hollow, almost haunted Wrigley Field. How do I convey that? Uh, you know, because of the way they went, because of the way the season went, and because of how access was through Zoom um, and all that stuff, I think it was a really good reminder of the importance of creativity and reporting. Um, Absolutely. And, and creative reporting in the sense that, like, who can I get? Who can I talk to? Who can I find out that adds this detail that I'm missing? Um, and how do I do that? You know, make phone calls, text, all that stuff, but also the power of observation, you know, in sports writing, you spend a lot of time watching the games and you learn the games and you learn the people, you know, don't, you know, don't forget to stop and, and watch what's happening. A lot of times you can observe the best story and the best details if you have your eyes open for anything. And that, that was a good reminder of, of that over the last few years. What could I observe? What little intricacy could I see that then I could write about or ask about that might unlock a whole bigger, better story? Wow, that's a great way of explaining it. I, and in a new perspective, we haven't heard from any any of our other winners. Derek, I, I wanna ask you as a last question and thank you so much, thank you so much for being here. Uh, what advice do you have for, for people just getting into the sports writing industry? Oh, um, get a nap now. Um, so get ahead on your sleep schedule now before it all starts. Um, <laughs> no, I think, uh, one thing, um, a couple of things that people, always, one thing I always tell, I'll tell students when they ask is you got to read, you know, read as much as you write. And, and that means, you know, read stories, read magazines, read books. You know, one of the things that, you know, I try to encourage students to do is read plays or go read a screenplay so that you, you kind of get in your ear how dialogue works. We write with quotes, a lot of us. Um, you know, when you write a long feature, you're gonna use quotes. What better way to learn how to use quotes than to go and read how, you know, like an Aaron Sorkin script works. Learn how to, you know, you can lose the cadence of the quotes to tell a story. Um, you know, read, you know, long form stories, read short form stories. If you got somebody who you like who read, writes good game stories, Read them and try to find out what they do. Read as much as you write, if not more. Um, certainly read as much as you tweet, if not more, um, to try to understand like just how stories come together. And then you kind of create a voice and an ear. Um, the other thing that, that I was reminded of the, the, this week, and it's, it's always one that I have to remind myself, so it's good that you ask, is always make the last phone call, the one that you're like, oh, do, I, do I need to make this phone call? You know, this person might not answer, this person might, or, you know, whatever text now, always make it. You know, I was working on a story and I was like, okay, I got, I got one more call to make. I'm not sure this guy's going to want to talk to me. But I, I should ask him this question. It's, it, I don't need it for the story. I don't really need it to complete the story. If I get a quote, then I'll just have to cut something else from the story. But I got to make the call. And I made the call. I got the, I, I got to ask the question. 
And then I got the quote that I needed and it was worth carving out something else from the story to put that quote in. So always make the last phone call, whether you're trying to hustle down a scoop or where, whether you're trying to flesh out a feature or whether you're trying to work on an investigative piece, then definitely make the final phone call to kind of put together the pieces. It's better. Um, I know you always get to that point where you're like just exhausted by having people not answer, but it's worth the attempt to make the final phone call. I love that advice. Read and make that final phone call. Derek, thank you so much for being here. Our 2021 Missouri Sports Writer of the Year and two times uh, Sports Writer of the Year from the National Sports Media Association. Uh, we'll hopefully see you this summer in Winston as well. Yeah, thanks. This has been a pleasure talking with you, man. Good luck to you. Thank you so much for reaching out.